Uh, so my name is Kate. I'm a CTO at a company called Eugene Lights. Um, for a background, I've been a developer for a long time, um, but I'm not an Android developer or a Google developer. Um, but a lot of the technology in this talk uh, will work across platforms. So um, I've given this talk for the AWS user group, I've given it to uh, poker heads as well, and I think that you'll be able to, to see the benefits um, of this technology for Android projects as well. So what I'm going to talk about, I'm firstly going to talk about my company, Eugene, and, and just to set some context of how we use GraphQL um, and Aspen. Then I'm going to talk about GraphQL itself, uh, which is the query language and the specification of GraphQL. And then AppSync, which is the AWS implementation of GraphQL. So everyone knows what AWS is when I say AWS, right? It's the Amazon uh, Web Services. So there's a lot of opinions in this talk. Um, you know, it's very specific to how we use it at UG. So if you disagree, if you've used it, if you see um, you know, other ways to use it, that's totally fine. Um, these are just my opinions and my experience. So it's a bit easier to keep it in there. So what's Eugene? So Eugene, we offer at-home genetic testing uh, to people who are thinking of starting a family. And so we want to offer information that empowers smarter health decisions. We want this to be actionable and we want this to be very compassionate. So what we want to do is help people make smarter health decisions. But what you're interested in is what Eugene is technically fixing. So Eugene is a bunch of stuff. So we have iOS, Android, and web apps. Then you can talk to our patient management system, our content management system, we have a secure video calling service which connects these things together, a uh, survey platform, shopping cart, logistics, notifications, and probably five other things that I've forgotten off this list. So we use AppSync to simplify this stack. So this is what it looks like. So our app has a local data store which talks to a single GraphQL endpoint that's hosted on AWS, and all of our services are aggregated by this graph. So it's nice and neat, even though we have so much going on under there. So that brings us to what is GraphQL. So I'm going to try and start at the beginning for you. So the point of GraphQL is to ask for what you need and get exactly that. So it's about optimizing the number of requests you need to make and the amount of data that you're fetching from your data source. So how it works is that you define a schema of all the data that's available in your API. And then you write resolvers to go and fetch all of that data. And then you pull that from the data source and your clients can write queries on this schema. And they can ask for what they need to display. So that means that you have one API that can serve all of your clients rather than separate ones here and there. As it's a specification, there's a lot of different GraphQL servers available in many languages, um, and they're mostly open source projects. You can look them up on the GraphQL website. So, let's see a demo, and see if this works on multiple screens. Here. Okay, not that one. <laughs> Sample GraphQL API that's publicly available. You can go into this, and there's links um, in, this, in the slides at the end. So anyone can go to this and just play around with GraphQL as much as you like. Is that big enough? Can people see? Yeah. Um, so what we have on this side is the query. Um, this is the data that we're getting in the middle. 
And this is our auto-generated documentation. So all of this documentation in this slide is generated from our schema, which I'll show you in a minute. So basically, we have a root object in our schema, and then these are all the queries that we can make on our schema. So we can look up all the films, all the people, all the planets, and then we can click through to see all the fields that we have on all of the data types. <coughs> so in people, we get a list of people, and then every person has a name, a birth year, eye color, and so on. So in this query, I'm looking up all people, and then I'm asking for the list of people, and for each of those people, I'm asking for their name, their hair color, and their home world. And then on their home world, I'm asking for their name and the climate of the home world. And so I run that query, and this is the result here. So you can see this data has come from presumably my person data source, and then the home world information has probably come from my, a separate data source. And they've been combined together into one result so that the client only has to make one difference. And so this is what a schema looks like. I'll scroll up to the top. So basically we're just implement we're just defining our types. So here is a type film. We've got some documentation, some extra comments, they're optional. And then we're saying what the fields are and what the types are of the fields. So you can see that you can get into connecting fields. So here we've got a field with the species connection that returns the species. So that's going to return a list as well as some pagination information. So just in case you didn't pick it up. Here's an example of a result. So here, my name is being fetched from my person service, and then the home world is being fetched from the planet service. So this is how we aggregate all of our microservices into one place, so they can be queried from the client side. So my favorite feature of GraphQL is how discoverable it is. And this is especially important at Eugene as we scale we don't want people to have to dig around and find out where all our APIs are, where our microservices are. It's a single endpoint and it's self-documenting, so it's really easy to pick up for new people. It also has the benefit of schema annotations, which is little um, notes you can put into the schema that give it new functionality. So one of the ones that's defined in the specification is deprecation of fields. So that way clients will be notified if they're using a field that's been deprecated and that helps us update our API over time. There's other annotations that AWS AppSync provides that are custom to AppSync, which are related to like security groups and things that people can um, access when they query that API. So let's move on to AppSync. So AppSync is the AWS implementation of GraphQL. It's managed GraphQL, it's serverless. It integrates with a lot of AWS services. It also provides SDKs for your client side, and it's just really easy to get started. So it's a really great way to start using GraphQL. Um, it's just so easy. So here's a picture of what we're talking about. Hopefully I've explained GraphQL well enough that you've kind of got this picture in your head already. But just to spell it all out, you have all your clients on the left side here that talk to AppSync, which is your GraphQL server. On your GraphQL server, you put your schema that defines all of your types and what can be queried, as well as your resolvers, which tell GraphQL how to fetch that information from all of your data sources, which are over here on the right. So, in AppSync, you have a lot of options for what your data sources can be. So you can connect to these existing uh, AWS services like DynamoDB, that's a NoSQL database, a relational database, caching, Lambda, etc., as well as your standard HTTP um, endpoint. So we use this to connect to our database uh, via Lambda, as well as our third-party services like our CMS, which we connect to through HTTP. Update 
think also has a lot of goodies for mobile development. So for free, you get offline caching and syncing, which if you've ever tried to implement that yourself, is a huge headache. So to have a first version that you just get for nothing is amazing. Um, it also offers real-time subscriptions, which is where you can stay connected over a web socket and receive data coming down rather than polling for it um, regularly. And like, there's limitations with what that's good for, but if it fits your use case, it's fantastic. So there's people who have, a lot of the examples that they use are, for instance, chat programs, where they just stay connected and they get the messages in real time. You also get a lot of code generation for the client, so things about importing your schema and your queries so you don't have to write them manually. So again, just to cover, if it's a new project and you don't have a lot of these things to begin with, it's a really powerful feature of AppSync that it integrates so well with Lambda, RDS, um, Cognito, which is an authentication system. All of these things you can get up and running very quickly if you don't have them already. So anyone who's heard of GraphQL before has probably heard of the n plus one problem. So let's talk about that. So this is where, when I showed before the diagram where you go out to the person service and the people and the planet service. So without any kind of optimization, this is what you're looking at. So here we're getting a user. This is the first yellow square on the left. So we've got their ID. Now we're going to get upcoming events for them. We found a list of five events. So now we're going to get the metadata, the venue, the tags, and the friends for those five events. So that's going to be five queries for five events. And then under that, we've got four users that are their friends. So that's going to be four queries on those five events. So that's 20 queries. So now we're looking at 47 queries for this one request. And so we hit this problem this week. And this is where this talk gets interesting. <laughs> so I mean, that's going to pretty quickly explode my database connections, um, as well as push me into pretty scary territory paying for Lambda requests. But fortunately, GraphQL has a solution for this. So this is batch invoke. So basically what it's gonna do is it's gonna save up all of those IDs and let me batch them in one request. So now instead of 47, we're looking at eight, because we're gonna get all the friends in one request. We're gonna get all the metadata in one request, all the event venues in one request. So last week, we hit this point and we went to implement batch and vote. And there's an undocumented limitation uh, in batch and vote, and that is that the batch size is always going to be five or less. So, while well, that's probably going to reduce my 47 requests to maybe like 20, still not really going to solve my problem uh, at scale. So <laughs> um, I discovered this problem when I went to implement it at the AWS Builder Day last week. So the AWS team was conveniently on site for me to ask them about this. Uh, and they basically said that I need to find another way to solve it because that number is not going to <laughs> um, so, it would have been really good to give this talk, say, last week before we found this problem, or maybe in like two weeks when we solved this problem. But today, I'm not sure how we're going to solve this problem. <laughs> but there's options. So, uh, we have caching options. Um, there's some interesting ideas around client batching um, that Facebook have been talking about, which is where you can request, uh, you can make fast queries and slow queries in the same request and get the stream of data back, um, which is an interesting idea. I'm pretty sure that's not supported by AppSync, but we'll look into it. 
Uh, data loader is how most people in GraphQL solve this problem. So this is a library <coughs> that Facebook developed specifically for this. I'm not sure how this will work with AppSync as well. Again, um, one of the issues of something that is just you know, serverless that we can just use straight away is that there's not a lot of customization options. So that may or may not work. Right now what we're going to do is throw money at resources and just skip those requests. <laughs> and we're probably going to start collaborating with our front end team to ask them to not make such expensive queries. But that's not an option for everyone if their API is public. So um, we'll see how we go. If you have any ideas, let me know. Um, this is an article on Medium where someone found this problem and a couple of other limitations that were documenting things around um, queries needing to return in a certain time and query data limits. Um, so if you're worried about these things, I've got a link uh, to this article, but these aren't things that we've put up against yet. So they also mentioned that um, they couldn't find a way to compress the request, which we did, so maybe things just need some more research sometimes. Um, another thing that we found was I wasn't sure how I could use a NoSQL database to back a GraphQL um, API. So let me explain. So with a NoSQL database, it's really important to know that your access pattern so that you can optimize the database in a way that you're not doing a full table scan all the time. With, no, with GraphQL, you don't know your access patterns, so you can't create indexes to be efficient. So however I turned it, I couldn't design relational data in a way that I could guarantee that it wouldn't do a full table scan some of the time, most of the time, I don't know. So we went with a relational database behind the scenes, which again is part of our problem with hitting the connection limit. So while a NoSQL database might be a way to scale, uh, I don't know, I, I couldn't find a way to do it. Um, infrastructure as code, this is something that you're going to need from day one. So your resolvers, so the way that you fetch data from your um, data sources, you need to define it somewhere. Um, and then you need to get it into AppSync. And so the only way to do that is through CloudFormation or through the, a plugin to the serverless framework if you're using that. Um, so this is just part of the learning curve is that you want to look into this as soon as possible. You don't want to be putting your resolvers into the console and then having them disappear or get overwritten or something. So something to consider. So in conclusion, um, GraphQL, I'm still excited about it, I still like it. Um, the discoverability, I think, uh, is just a huge feature. We found that it allows us to do quite fast and quite big changes to the API, um, and it definitely helps in our prototyping. And then the modularity of being able to point certain fields at certain data sources and then being able to look at AppSync patterns is really good for us. AppSync, uh, uh, new projects, I think it's really good. I think being able to bootstrap to other AWS services definitely speeds things up and um, AppSync itself is super easy to get started on. If you have existing projects, I don't know if these opinions and limits that have been put into AppSync is going to um, cause problems for you, but it's less it's less effort to find out that it's going to be a problem if you start with AppSync, hit those problems, and then move on to an alternative. At least you kind of know where your problems are, and you can address them faster. So what are those alternatives? Well, you can roll your own GraphQL server, and I would ask, are your problems big enough for that? Is your team big enough for that? I don't know. Maybe they are. Um, and then Apollo Server is a competitor, I guess. So that's managed GraphQL on Apollo. A lot of the AWS technology is actually built on Apollo. So maybe that's good. Maybe you'll have the same problems. Not sure. And that's the end of my talk. <laughs> um, so if you have any questions, you can find me here. Um, 
we are looking for Android devs at Eugene, so you can also contact us at hello at Eugene Labs. Um, and if you're curious about our genetic testing services, you can find us at eugenelabs.com.